Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation. Glad you are a citizen, at least for, oh, about an hour every week here on the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Another great discussion in store for you today. The founder, yeah, of Wild Rose Kennels. You met the current owner, but you'll meet the founder and the author of Absolutely Positively Gun Dog Training. His name is Robert Milner. Lots to come about that and how it works and why it works and all of that. The Upland Nation is outfitted by the folks at Cabela's. My name is Scott Linden. In addition to our in-depth discussion about dog training and dog behavior, we'll also cover some pop- public access tips, hunting strategy, dog handling advice. We'll go on a little adventure or two. And as always, a few tips and tactics. So, how's your week going? You sheltering in place while still getting in some dog training, I hope, and staying close to the family, too. Uh, As you hear over and over again, my challenge with Flick these days is steadiness to wing shot and fall, and every day we're getting just a little bit closer. You know, you train on pigeons, and then you wonder, well, what else is going to happen when you get off pigeons? Luckily, we have a whole bunch of valley quail out behind the house, and once in a while we'll find them. Today, uh, progress. Flick held a point on a valley quail, female, who flew hard and low right over his head. He moved about four feet, but without any encouragement from me, that's all he did. And I consider that a small victory. How about yourself? What are you working on these days? And are you making any progress? Let me know on the Facebook pages. Love to hear about what you're doing and how you're doing it because I am a constant student of everything. And if you want to learn more, of course, a couple of the new videos out on the Facebook page and my YouTube page as well um, on public access hunting around here on South Dakota. I'll give you some how to's, some why to's, and then. Uh, a little checklist in the current edition of Pointing Dog Journal that I authored for Jake Smith over there that uh, might get you ahead of the curve when it comes time to go hunting this fall. And gosh dang it, we will go hunting this fall. Things are loosening up. Let's hope that it's still loosened even more as we get to uh, fall and bird hunting season. Okay, a couple quick announcements before we jump into our discussion with Robert Milner, the founder of Wild Rose Kennels and now at Duck Hill Kennels. First off, Sage and Breaker gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. Good news for everybody who's been asking. Both the long gun and handgun cleaning mats are back in stock. And if you want to hear about that kind of stuff the moment it happens, sign up for their Uh, mailing list at sageandbreaker.com. Lots of bundles on sale at doctor.com. Whether you want the TNB Dual that I use all the time on Flick or you want some other training collar, bark collar, or anything else in the way of dog training collars and related equipment, it's all at dogtra.com. All right, enough of that commercial chatter, although I do appreciate your support sponsors, and I hope you all listening will support them as well with your business. But right now, it's time to get to the phone and Robert Milner, the founder of Wild Rose Kennel and now Duck Hill Kennels, and uh, what I think might be the oldest breeder and trainer of British Labrador Retrievers in the entire continent. Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Glad to be here. Now, back when you were looking at all of that sort of thing, what uh, what attracted you so much to uh, British Labradors? Well, I ran, uh, I'll give you a quick breakdown. I, I, I came off active duty in the Air Force in 1972 and and uh, opened Wild Rose, and I was training, training uh, American Labradors for American field trials and and also gun dogs, and I did that for about uh, ten years, and and I was I got pretty burned out, and I was about ready to hang up the towel because uh, the dogs were it's pretty hard work, and 
uh, my dogs were not the most cooperative in the world. And about that time, I, I uh, happened to go to England and ran into a, met a guy named Morty Turner Cook, who was a retired British Army major that swam off the beach at Dunkirk. And Morty and I hit it off, and Morty introduced me to their to their shooting and to the dogs over there and uh, and the training. And I looked at all that and said, this is the way it's supposed to be. And when I got back home, I said, <laughs> I uh, proceeded to get rid of the American dogs and start bringing over the British dogs. It what? made my life a lot more pleasant. A lot more fun. Oh, I can only imagine. You know, having been around the field trial world a little bit, not as a competitor, but as a helper, if yeah. you will, in many yeah. regards, it's pretty intense. And and I would imagine the client side of that is is even more so. Um, you know, fundamentally, just just for the record, explain if you can briefly the difference between, uh, say, a British style Labrador and an American style Labrador, and and how that translates to the field uh mainly it's uh, the main difference is in the breeding selection uh, in, in the i'm not going to talk about american field trials but i'm uh, uh, the british field trials are run on an actual day of shooting not a simulated day it's uh their first rule is in their field trial regulations is no no dog can be tested on a bird that's been touched with human hands. So you can't pick up a bird and throw it in a field trial. Wow. It, uh, so you're, you're talking about you're, you're evaluating the dogs while they're doing their real job. Therefore, the breeding selection uh, is breeding for that. And it's mainly the, 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 major, the major two characteristics are, and, and the which are also the things that British field trial judges look for, is uh, number one, calm demeanor, good manners, quiet, well-mannered. Uh, and the second thing is track down a wounded bird. Uh, and if, if they don't see those two behaviors uh, you know, during a trial, they're not gonna give a dog a place probably. Uh, even even if he just didn't get a chance to track down a cripple. <laughs> well, you know, it, from from the, even from that brief description, it sounds like your philosophy toward training fits right in. Uh, the the book that caught my attention first, of course, was absolutely positively gun dog training, and then learning more about all of that, and then. You know, we used to be a part of the horse world here at our house as well, and the whole idea of uh, horse yeah. whispering and all of that. And you've you've been around all of that in a way. So, you know, bundle it all into one thing and tell us, in a nutshell, what your training philosophy is. Uh, my training philosophy is show them how to do it right and repeat it and repeat it. I get uh, it. <laughs> and, and, ign and ignore anything they do wrong no punishment period okay so um this sounds like a bf skinner kind of a behavioral modification strategy am i close on that exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> okay if, if you took demagogy of te teaching in college everybody you know what i'm talking about there but yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's the opposite, which is, I guess we'll use the term aversion when you, when you try and teach somebody or some animal or in particular a gun dog, what not to do because it's no fun anymore. And I'm being political about that, but, but the, you you focus primarily, if not completely on just the opposite, just encouraging positive behavior or, uh, compliant behaviors, maybe a better term. Setting it up so the dog does what I want. Yeah. And paying that. Yeah. Um, and if I don't set it up right and he does it wrong, we just simplify it and come back again tomorrow and yeah. try again. Yeah. So um, uh, it's really about neural pathways, quite frankly. 
Okay, hold that thought because I want I I, yeah. I, I love that idea. Um, I'm going to tell you two things. You, I'm not the first to tell you. You you have a friend in Delmar Smith, of course, who told us many years ago: never give a dog a chance to fail. And and number yeah. and number yeah. two, um, I've just lost that thought. But the the, the idea being that um, you um, you you just want to build from where they are to where you want them to go. Uh, in baby steps, it sounds like. And, yeah. And you just yes. you just referenced if it ain't working, go back a, a few steps, if you will. Uh, if I'm interpreting you right, am I am I on the right yes. track? Yes. Uh, if the dog can't do it, then the trainer set it up wrong. Uh huh. And he and he needs to rejigger it and make it simpler. Well. And then come and then come back I one get, or two days later. Uh, I get that. And and I'm a believer in that, you know, letting it settle if if you can, let them forget what they learned wrong. Um, yeah. But you mentioned neural pathways, and I, and I'm I'm really intrigued by that. Uh, I I'm working on it intently right now with my German wire hair, so I've got a personal interest in this. Tell me how you how you create those pathways. Uh, you get. You get the exact. But let me give you an example. Great. Of there's a uh, every every dog trainer that wants to be really good needs to read a book called The Talent Code by a guy named Daniel Coyle, and it's all about centers of excellence for world class athletes, musicians, uh, singers. Uh, basketball players and I'll, I'll uh, I think my, my favorite example is is uh, John Wooden who's uh, a UCLA's uh, basketball co coach back in the 70s uh, uh, he won in a 12 year period won uh, I think ten, 9 or 10 NCAA championships and, 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 and his his principles are, are number one: don't look for a big, quick improvement. Seek the small improvement, one day at a time. That's the only way it happens. And it would happen when it happens. It lasts. It means it goes into long-term memory. Uh, and then he shows the importance of repetition until automat automaticity cannot be over overstated. And then he says, repetition is the key to learning. That that is how you achieve excellence in 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 training, either athletes or dogs or horses, uh, all the same way. And it's it, it's uh, you're setting it up to where they do it right, and you're doing it in small small pieces of progress. Well, let, 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 let's do exactly that, just so that we kind of grok this whole thing a little bit more completely. I get it. I was lucky enough to meet Coach Wooden back in the day, in his prime, in fact. Um, but um, uh, most people haven't, haven't understood, you know, quite his philosophy, which is incredible and very deep. You know it way better than most of us. But let's take a, a simple skill, and, and, and let's take a Labrador, because you're, you're very familiar yeah. with them uh we want yeah. this dog to go from at heel oh 25 yards out into the yard and pick up that bumper and bring it back so yeah. i get it and most of those dogs will do it without any co coaxing at all because that's what they're born to yeah. do but sure <clears throat> pardon me but if they won't how are we going to break that into 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 the the bite-sized pieces where they will always excel yeah. You're going to ask for 10 feet the first time instead of 25. <laughs> okay, I get that, and and I'm there. Um, but what? how do we get them to actually understand that they're supposed to go pick it up and put it in their mouth and bring it back? They're, they're born with that. Okay. That what, you're, what you're really asking me is, in, in my mind, what you're really asking me is how do I deal with the effect of the punishment that, that – uh, taught him not to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. See, that's why you're a trainer and I'm an amateur. Let me let me give you my favorite example. For, well, puppies 
If puppies quit retrieving, it's due to punishment. And the first example is you're sitting there watching television in the evening and the puppy comes into the living room carrying the wife's Ferragamo shoe in his mouth and you step over there, grab the shoe, whack him on the snout, say, no, no, and you go back to watch the television. Yeah, uh, yeah. And two days two days later, you go out in the yard and throw him a dummy and he runs out there and sniffs it and doesn't pick it up. It's because you trained him not to do that two days before. Oh, amen to that. And you're absolutely right. I'm going to, uh, 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 I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I, uh, in my own book, I talk about dogs yeah. thinking literally and linearly and, uh, yeah. and we, 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 we are more abstract thinkers most of the time. Sometimes we're not, especially after three or four beers, but, <laughs> but, uh, so, so, you know, we forget that a dog puts two and two together and always gets four always. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a great example. By the way, everybody, you're listening to Robert Milner, the author of Absolutely Positively Gun Dog Training. You can get it, among other things, at duckhillkennels.com and other places as well. Uh, I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. So, so instead of punishing a dog because they retrieved the wrong thing, Robert, what should we have done in that case? Because that is just a classic Oh, you you go, you go over there, you get him to come on to you with the shoe, and you put your hand on the shoe and pat him on the head and say, thank you for that nice delivery to <laughs> And you put the, shoe, put the shoe where the dog can't get it. Uh, here's the other one uh, on puppies quitting retrieving. is It's the insidious one, which is... Uh, Puppies are using 90% of their energy when they're under six months. They're using most of their energy to grow. And when you go out and throw 15 or 20 retrieves out in the yard, because it's fun, uh, and we bred the off switch out of these dogs, and about after about the fifth one, he's starting to get muscle burn and and heat build up, and he's getting uncomfortable but we've selectively bred him to retrieve, so he ain't quitting. <laughs> and so he'll keep doing that for a while, but it's cumulative. So a week or two down the line, you're finally going to hit his limit, and he's going to quit retrieving. And you're going to say, he's not worth a damn. Yeah. What's wrong with that dog? You know, uh, uh, I, I agree a hundred percent. I, I hope maybe because I'm lazy and I don't, you know, but I do not want my dog to fail in training. So I, I paid kind of a rule around here. If my dog does something right three times, we're on to the next project. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead. Well, I would say twice as fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, you, most people train too long as well. Because uh, the, whatever the little piece of lesson is that they have learned that day needs to go into long-term memory, and that means it needs to it needs to be clear-cut, and the dog needs to go into a low-distraction environment, preferably where he can take a nap before you do anything else. If you if you go do five different behaviors. In the same train, in the same training session, you're going to be putting scrambled eggs into long-term memory. So, if I hear you, you right, Robert, you're saying dog dog do, do, performs well a couple times on whatever it is. Put him yep. up for a bit. Put him up. Let him uh, think about it, if um, you will. Well, I'd say put him up and put him in the kennel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it for the day. Okay. All right. So, you know, if somebody sends their dog to a pro trainer, and, and I don't want your, your trade secrets, but that dog gets, I mean, a good pro trainer is going to work with that dog, you know, a few times a day on a few things, but that dog is primarily pondering and napping over these things most of the day, isn't he? Uh, it is a, it is a, a 
basic inherent flaw to work a dog three or four times a day. Okay. The University of Copenhagen did a study in, I don't know, 2006 or so uh, on frequency and duration of training sessions. And they, they divided uh, a group of 50 beagles into four groups. And uh, one group was trained, they call them W1, was one day a week, one session on that day. W3 was uh, one day a week, three sessions on that day. D1 was five days a week daily, one session on each of those days. And then D3 was five days a week with three sessions on each of those days. And they documented all that stuff. And the dog that learned the fastest and the highest was trained one day a week, one session a day. The dog that trained to the lowest level and the slowest progress was D3, five days a week, three sessions a day. Wow. You... So that, that, is, that is more... It's an example of the superstition that we got in in traditional dog training. We got a lot of stuff in there that's that's very counterproductive. Well, you know what's funny is um, I I used to be a musician and uh, theoretically am trained to you know to play pretty well or was back in the day, and we were up against the same thing. Uh, as a as a conservatory student, we were ordered basically to practice all the time, all day, every yeah. day, if you could, yeah. you know, 20 yeah. times a day, if you could get to the practice room and every yeah. day, you know, if you laid off on Sunday, you felt guilty the whole rest of the week. So you're saying um, the, the dog's going to absorb more and uh, and perform better when it messes. Now, now, how does that jibe with your idea of repetition and rewarding positive reps? Uh, well, you have two you have two things to juggle. You got you need the, the repetitions on the nerve pathway, but you've got to have the the will to do it as well and the eagerness. To, you're training emotional state as well as a specific behavior. You have to think of it in those terms. So what do you do the rest of the week? <laughs> you get, well, what I tell people that are in love with training, they got to do it every day, get two or three dogs. Yeah. Or if you, if you want to train two, an hour or two a day, get five or six dogs, uh, and you will be more successful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you now, can take that same dog, that one dog, and you'll just take ten times longer to get where you want to go. I, I get it. I get it. Um, and that will build those neural pathways. So, so, uh, so the dog's not just laying around in the kennel the rest of the time. It's probably socializing, maybe getting a whole bunch of exercise. What else happens oh, at Duck Hill Kennels? Yeah. Well, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna sit in the kennel the rest of the time, except for. They might they take a walk, uh, uh, and that's they they get a couple of walks, and they'll get one training session. And and they will not learn the wrong things that way as well. They will not get. They will not learn the wrong things, and they will learn the right things three to four times as fast. Wow, uh, you've just saved me hours. Per week, Robert. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, if you want to spend those hours on dog training, get a few more dogs. Oh, that's not my job. My job is to talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on your on your musician uh, status, uh, the, the world class musicians uh, practice about three hours a day. Yeah. And that's uh, read that book, Talent Code. It applies to musicians. Uh, ball trainers, horse trainers, yeah. basketball coaches, well, baseball, etc. <laughs> you know what you you know what you you just described is the difference between human years and dog years. You know, if the dog gets ten minutes 
once a week, we could get three hours once a day and it'd probably be proportional, but, but that's for scientists to decide. Uh, hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. That's Robert Milner. He founded Wild Rose Kennels. His new, uh, new ish operation is Duck Hill Kennels. Learn more about him at duckhillkennels.com. His book uh, should be a Bible for anybody who thinks uh, they uh, they know their way around dog training. Absolutely, positively, gun dog training is one of the many books available. Learn all about it at duckhillkennels.com. We're going to take a quick break right here. Robert, put your feet up and relax a little bit. I'll get back to you in a moment. In the meantime, everybody else, pay attention. We've got a lot more to talk about, both with Robert Milner and then a couple things coming up. First, the Handle It segment of the show where we, uh, well, I share something I learned the hard way so you don't have to with your dog. And then, of course, public access, a suggestion for you for this season coming up. But first, write this down or go to your uh, iPad or whatever else you use, drtims.com, drtims.com. My performance dog food has been for a long, long time for a bunch of reasons. One, including the antioxidants that Tim Hall puts into his foods. And there are a variety of formulations there. So you'll find one no matter what time of year it is or what kind of dog you have. Learn more at drtims.com. And when you're there, place your first order and get 30% off by using the code UplandNation. D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. 30% off. Upland Nation is the code. Now, I know it's a pain, but wearing hearing protection in the field is probably a really good idea. I've been there and done that. I've worn them all. But my friend Jack Homa at ESP, Electronic Shooters Protection, has convinced me well, mainly through his technology. Learn more about how he makes these things and how they work at ESPAmerica.com. You know how it works on the range. You know, you can hear the trap machine if you've got good hearing protection, but you don't hear the gunshots. You can hear your buddies joking about your shooting abilities. Well, I can. I don't think they know they are heard by me, and maybe I should keep that a secret. But in the field as well, you can hear the birds flushing, you can have a conversation, you can hear the quail calling, you can hear your dog, your dog's beeper, your dog's bell. All of those things are possible if you have great hearing protection from ESPAmerica.com. And now a tip. We're talking about dog training and uh, one of my favorite subjects, by the way, if you hadn't gathered yet yet. The Handle It segment is brought to you by Cabela's. We're calling you, or talking to you at least, from the Cabela's podcast studio. 40% off and select products in their Cabela's camping classic. You know where to find them. Now, vis-a-vis -vis our discussion with Robert Milner, the old adage goes, hope for the best, plan for the worst. Well, Flick is getting steadier by the day, as I described earlier on flushing and falling birds one way to ensure that always takes place is to stage manage virtually everything early on so i use launchers i use check cords i use e-collars i use all of those things so that nothing can go wrong think about the worst case scenario plan for it allow for all sorts of ways to prevent it from happening do most of your training in the yard where you have a little bit more control. And then when you're ready, take as much of that out into the field as you can for training. And then more training. And then more training. Hope for the best. Plan for the worst. I bet that's probably something that Robert Milner, the author of Absolutely Positive Gun Dog Training, would agree with. Robert, am I on the right track there? You're, you're close. Where I would change it would be get them get them great in the yard and then bring the distraction to the yard yeah rather than, rather than taking the dog off to a new place to, to meet it <laughs> yeah you know good point and you know uh, that that reminds me of something i learned four or five dogs ago from a good friend who's a behaviorist 
uh, he used the term place learning. You know what I'm talking about there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so obviously at some point you do have to go away from the yard, but you're right. You know, little baby steps again, you know, creating those neural pathways, like you said, right? Yeah. 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 And they're going to, all the cues in the yard are going to, are going to help the dog do what you want him to do. Well, let, you know, you used a term that I really like, and, and I've, I don't use it enough. I'm going to steal it from you. I've probably stolen it from other people and forgotten, but cues. You know, I mentioned the half itch, and Rick and Ronnie and Delmar before that used that half itch around a dog's flank, and, and it could be any number of other things. It could be verbal. It could be oral. It could be anything. What kind of cues do you use when you're training dogs to, in a positive way? Oh, boy. Uh, you just opened yourself up for a lecture here. <laughs> that, that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's why they pay me the big bucks. Let me. Cues are very important, and it's very important that they be separate and distinct. And that means keep your mouth shut when you're training, except for the cue. Uh, and your your dog will be a bit do a uh, hundred times better, ten times better anyway. Uh, Pavlov did, not only did he do his uh, I don't want to get too scientific here not only did he, he do the uh, salivation experiment he did one on cue discrimination and he trained a behavior A cued by tone A and he trained a behavior B uh, cued by, by uh, tone B and on the same dog, uh, and he started the, the tones were on a tunable signal generator, and he started tuning tone A closer to tone B, and when they got pretty close together, and the dog started having trouble figuring out which one he was to respond to, he literally had a nervous breakdown. And it got very fearful in his experimental apparatus, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is a very powerful, powerful phenomenon. Uh, and it made me become very careful about being very precise with my cues and not, not punctuating them with emotion, shall we say. Uh, and it makes the dogs operate a lot better. Well, okay, so we don't have a tone generator, though. So um, no, what are we using? So, so you just keep, you, you use a word, whatever words you want. Uh, let's take recall. Uh, recall is the most important thing that a dog learns. Come in, come in when called. Uh, typically, you know, I, when I back in the old days when I was training and then in the not so old days when I was training, uh, it would be, I was using here and it, the word, and it would be here, 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 damn it, come over here. And the dog is sitting there saying, I wonder which one he means. Does it mean one here, three here's, or three here's with a damn it? Uh, because they're just hearing a noise. Sure. And they, they don't know the meaning of it. Uh, when I got that concept digested, my dog training improved a whole lot. I get it. Uh, yeah. In fact, yeah, you, you just cited the uh, my every single one of my German wire hair pointers, <clears throat> first names has been damn it. Yeah, <laughs> but okay. So, so I I get that. So, what the uh, cues are? Uh, what some people would call commands. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, some, some yeah. people might call them requests. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> what about praise? How do we how do we reward these dogs down the road if they respond positive? If they respond correctly it, to it the... works. It's fine. It's work. It works. The, the more you use it as a tool the better it'll work, mm -hmm. which means you don't give it gratuitously all the time. Yeah. Uh, There's a guy named John Pilly that did a, a, 
uh, he's a retired, he, he's dead now, but he, he was a PhD in animal behavior and was uh, at Wofford College for 20 years and retired. And his retirement project was to uh, to train a border, he got a border collie puppy and he was going to train it to recognize as many uh, words as he could. And he, the way he taught it a word was he had it to go, he named a toy and he'd say, get, uh, get the frog or get the circle or uh, get the plastic white dummy. Uh, uh, and he got up over a thousand of that. Wow. That that, that, that dog learned. Wow. Uh, let me give you my two rules of dog training. <laughs> number, number one is dogs are smart. Yeah. And number two is do dogs do what pays. So as, as the trainer, trainer needs to keep it challenging for the dog and not where I'm not on the mission and recognize that he is smart. And and, and number two is, uh, uh, what is number two? I just had a senior moment. <laughs> uh, dogs, dogs do what pays. Make sure you're paying him. Yeah. And, and make sure you know what a payment is. Well, uh, that's, I know, I know what I use. I, I pay off my dog in any number of ways, um, uh, whether it's a, you know, a, a verbal praise or it's uh, depending on the skill I'm trying to teach. It might be a, a food treat. It might be a release. It might be something that I, you know, scratching him on his chest. What, what do you use most yeah. of the time in that regard? Oh, whatever I can think of. Yeah. Whatever, whatever the dog wants. Yeah. I'll, I'll use water and hot weather. I'll use an opportunity to chase a squirrel when I know where the squirrel is. Uh, I'll use a, a, certainly a, a, a frequently a retrieve reward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tug of war, and yes, tug of war is okay for for retrievers. <laughs> yeah, it's it's my favorite reward because it's always with me. Yeah, yeah that's true. Carry around a pocket yeah. full of treats. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that can get kind of messy. I found that the hard way, but uh, I still yeah. use it when I need to. But but you know, so 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 what we ought to be doing, and it yeah, you know, I, I sound like a broken record. Records are these big black things that go around at thirty three RPMs. By the way, if you're under age forty, you probably don't know that, but uh, um, uh, they make sound. Um, usually music, but uh, if I was on that session, you can judge for yourself. But um, uh, so so. What you know, I've I've used them all, uh, and uh, I guess what I'm getting at is we need to watch the dog. We need to learn what the dog really values. Is that a good way to yes. look at it? Exactly. Yes. So if if we're given yes. food all the time and he doesn't really give a rip about food, maybe we do need to give him a retrieve or a squirrel chase or whatever. Or find the food that he does like. Yeah. There you, you go. Know. Yeah. It might that, be the wrong food. Yeah. That's pretty easy to put put eight or ten different treats on the floor and see which one he likes. That's, <laughs> that's that looks like eat. a dog food commercial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's pretty simple. Uh, that's uh, that's Robert Milner. He is the author of the book "Absolutely Positively Gun Dog Training." Learn more about all of the things he does and the way he thinks at duckhillkennels.com. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. You know, uh, when we arranged this little uh, discussion, you mentioned do, starting to work on some things. Uh, well, number one, first off, that there is there is fundamentally there is a book online that you can just download if you're a retriever guy. I think that's important. So go to the website to yeah. learn that. But also you and I have talked about um, maybe doing some things online, and so are you. Are you still working on that? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I'm. I, I do a two-day class that takes you through the history of of, of Labrador starting in the 1500s <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and up to the present, and and uh, how they got to where they are, and all the behavioral uh, uh, stuff. Uh, um, 
the easy way to train a dog. Uh, I, I like to keep everything very simple, and I find that the dog likes to keep everything very simple. Yeah, and uh, so does so does this this guy. So I'm I'm with you on that a hundred percent. Hey, but, let's... but I'm doing I do a I do a two day class once a month on that thing at the kennel, and I've just started putting it on Zoom. It, it cost 150 bucks to come to the kennel, but it's free on Zoom. <laughs> wow. And, uh, uh, so uh, the next one is uh, May the 22nd and 23rd. Great, great. Perfect timing. All right. Eight, eight hours, two days in a row. Okay, everybody, sign up now. I bet I bet for your uh, 150 bucks you'll get a lot more than that well, amount. Yeah, well, the Zoom is free. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the Zoom's free. All right. So let's let's uh, let's go to um, uh, the world of client relations and the the big challenges that these people bring you for dog training and hunting. What are the most common things that you end up having to try and fix for people? Uh, deliver the hand. And coming, but well, eighty eighty percent of training of any dog is the recall. Of yeah. The, yeah. Uh, if you got if you got if you got a approved proof on the on the uh, idiot proof on the on the recall, you're eighty percent of the way where to wherever you need to go. I don't care what the dog's job is. Yeah. Yeah. So how do how do we how do we solve some of those? I've got a, a hard headed wire hair. Uh, you deal with Labradors. Somebody else, Shutter has a Springer Spaniel. Um, no, just joking. That was a joke, everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so so what you know? What, so how are we going to get a dog that's reluctant to come back to us? I'm going to tell you the quick one uh, uh, version. The abbreviated version uh, is. Uh, First of all, pick a recall signal. Pick two recall signals. Uh, you're going to start with the one you don't want because you're going to you're going to fail <laughs> the first time. Uh, what a great! <laughs> okay, you just saved everybody a lot of angst. That's great. All right, carry on. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and the second one is the one you really want. So you're going to you get a notebook and a little pocket notebook. Draw draw a vertical line, divide each page into two columns, number number the line, number the horizontal line so you know how many trials. And you take that dog out, take it for walks. And you call him every once in a while. You start out close to you, you call him. And I use their name uh, because this, for me, recall is the emergency procedure. <laughs> uh, sure. When he's getting when there's a Mack truck coming down the highway and he's headed for it, uh, I want him to stop right then. <laughs> and uh, I don't want a whistle because I might not know where my whistle is. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to use a, 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 a verbal, and I'm usually going to use his name because I'm usually with several other dogs, and I, I want the instant recall from one of them. Uh, and and I'm gonna take him for walks, and I'll start at five feet, and I'll call him Rover, and he comes to me. I pay him. I'll give him a treat, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll we'll pretty much work out that out distance until he's coming from 200 yards, and I'll I'll start looking for some distractions to get him around, so I can learn let him learn to to come away from distractions and I'll start close to me and far from the distraction the first few and then move out move out the distance away from me and I'll put them in rabbit pens pheasant pens duck pens uh, dog parks I want them coming 100% of the time all the time but the first time I, t I did this. I uh, let the dog get out about 30 yards, and I say, Rover. 
and he doesn't come. And I say, Rover, Rover, Rover. And then Rover, 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 come here, damn it. And every time I say Rover, I've got to write it down in that notebook. Uh-huh. My two my two columns are correct response, C O R and failed response. And when I uh when I say rover and he comes, I get to put down a CR left hand column. When I say rover, 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 I've got to put down five FRs for the next five lines down there. Because I've had fail, five failed responses. And you can dig a hole to China real quick with that. So is that when you uh, is that when you start using your alternate command word Q? No, no. <laughs> when do that you do is, that? That I do that when I fail on the when I get a week or two down the line and I count up all the failed responses and correct responses and find out I'm at sixty percent or something. That's a failure. Yeah. Uh, so I tear it up and start over again so that I don't have a poisoned cue to overcome. Got it. Love that. Uh, every failed response costs you 10 correct responses. I believe it. I, you know, we, we've talked in the past with other trainers about the, uh, the uh, proportion of uh, praise to correction, if you will, um, yeah. and it you know it sounds about the same there. So, yeah. yeah. Beyond recall, uh, what is another uh, critical uh, uh, cue slash skill that that most hunting dogs need that we don't do a good job training? Uh, for the bird dog world, it's sit to flush or stay to flush. Yeah. Depending on whether it's a pointer or a flusher. Because uh, they can get shot when they're uh, when they're chasing a flushing bird. Oh, I know. And I knock wood. I've never seen it, but I've heard it. So, so I'm, you know, this yeah. is right, right in my wheelhouse today because that's what we're working on. Are, uh, what, uh, you got some tips for me? You know, <clears throat> my young wire hair, he's solid on pigeons uh he's less solid on valley quail but we're in that him, transitioning period let him watch a whole lot of, let him watch a whole lot of them fly away yeah so that it doesn't he gets to retrieve less of them but gets to see a lot more of them changes the value of the bird for it. Yeah. makes that flying away bird work worthless you know yeah you, you, you know you're absent and, and and you know that jibes with of course everybody else who says oh train on wild birds and they'll teach themselves it, it you know there is some truth to that and that's exactly why oh yeah yeah you're, you're i had a that's i knew an old a british trainer uh uh that uh was very short and singing somebody asked it was a woman uh um uh, asked her uh, what do you do for a dog that's chasing birds that means chasing freshly, freshly flushed birds in England they're not supposed to chase them <laughs> sure yeah <laughs> uh, so uh, and, and she said let them chase them and what she meant was uh, they're not going to catch any of them anyway uh, they don't they don't uh they're birds of wild when they are when they are when they are being shot, uh, and they're not going to catch them anyway. They will learn pretty quick that they're not. And they they it makes them worthless. Maybe worthless, so they quit chasing them. Yeah, like you Except said, um, you know, encourage uh, uh, the dog to do what pays and quit doing yeah. what doesn't pay. It's pretty pretty clear yeah. in that case, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, what I teach, what I teach people, and frankly, on the on, on retrievers for flushing dogs, uh, is number num number one. The only thing you got to train before you go hunting with a Labrador is uh, 
you need to uh, you, you need to train him to sit the flush. Yeah. So you, you just walk him along, walk him along, and uh, at heel and throw a throw a dummy out and have him sit. And yeah. you do that a few times, he's going to automatically start sitting when you throw a dummy out. But you just you don't let him pick any of them up. And then, and then you just throw, throw one behind you every once in a while as a payment for the nice sit to flush that he just gave you. I um now I'm I'm interested because we're at that point we're using uh, uh frozen game birds for for that exact yeah. drill right there. <clears throat> but you said something that uh, yeah. I think a lot of us haven't thought about. The, the big dead bird falls in front of us. He, in our case, you know, on the, in the pointing world, we, we want him to stand yeah. still. Whoa. Uh, yeah. your world, you want him to sit. It depends on who's dog, what kind of dog, but then you're yeah. lobbing, you're lobbing the, the, the reward bird, if you will, in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. Reward them behind you. And the reason for that, just so that I have it clear in my own feeble mind so they're expecting something behind them rather than it's flying away. Ah, ha, 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 ha. So it's, it's not a reward for chasing. It's a reward for not going after the one you just sent out front. Yeah, and, and a lot of guys will, of course, go out and pick them all up, even shot birds in a hunting situation for that very reason, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. They may not know yeah, that's yeah. what it is, but but I the get more it. You do, the, more, the more you do that, the steadier the dog's going to get. I'm loving it because there's, there's, yeah. uh, you know, a flying bird, a falling bird. There's never any forward progress by the dog. That is so right. clear. Thank you. Right. I mean, that was worth its weight in electricity, which is all I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, you know, we, we barely scratched the surface here and I want to encourage everybody to go and read a whole bunch of this stuff at duck hill kennels.com. Get the book. It's called Absolutely Positively Gun Dog Training. It's going to change your philosophy, if not your life, and your dog is going to be better off for it. The author, again, Robert Milner, Duck Hill Kennels. He's been around the block a few times, uh, <clears throat> taught a few people a little bit about uh, dog training over the years, and uh, I'm just intrigued. Can we do this again down the road sometime, Robert? Oh yeah, I'd love to. So would I'm, I. So um, with that in I'm mind, I'm going to send you. I'm going to email you a copy of my uh, uh, class schedule. Great, uh, great. Send, send me an email, so I'll have your email address. I'll do all of that, and then we'll post all that up as well. And everybody else there, you know how to find him: DuckHillKennels.com. To be continued. But in the meanwhile, Robert Miller. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for spending an hour with everybody here in the Upland Nation. Well, Scott, I appreciate it very much. Uh, at this stage of my life, my my job is to make life better for the dogs. So anything I can do in that direction is greatly appreciated. You did just that, and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, Scott. You have a good day. But the rest of you, stay with me. We've got a lot more to cover, including that This Land is Your Land public access tip. It's coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. Quick word from Gunner Kennels. Free shipping, of course, at gunner.com. It's the only crate on the market to offer built-in stainless steel tie-down pins. All right, I know that's just a little minutia that you maybe didn't really care about, except when it comes to safety. All other tie-down pins on all other dog crates pulled off on impact. How much is your dog worth? Well, they haven't got that calculator at Gunner.com, but they got all sorts of great reasons, including some stunning videos on why Gunner Kennels will protect your dog better than any other kennel on the market. Learn more at Gunner.com. And learn more about dog training collars and all the related gear at dogtra.com for your needs in that world i will give you 10 percent off use the code slun10 
and get 10% off at dogtra.com, including on my TNB dual collar. If you like working two dogs at the same time, but you don't like the hassles that come with a touch screen, especially if you're wearing gloves, look at the TNB dual. Two sets of buttons, no toggling back and forth. Did I say no toggling back and forth? Let me just repeat that. No toggling back and forth. Many bundles are now on sale at dogtra.com as well. Free shipping on anything over 200 bucks, including the TNB Duel. And 10% off if you use the code SLUN10. And that is our cue to talk a little bit about do-it-yourself hunting, public access, walk-in, whatever else you want to call it. We call it all of that, and depending on the state you're in, it could be public ground, it could be private ground. If you want to learn more about that topic, go to my new website, findbirdhuntingspots.com, brought to you by our friends at Huron, South Dakota, the Ringneck Nation. Now, I don't have a spot for you this time. I have a suggestion in terms of a strategy. As you well know, or you should, this land is your land. Millions of acres of publicly owned ground that we citizens hire folks like the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service to administer on our behalf. I only tell you that because sometimes we lack the empowerment that we really ought to have as we try to negotiate the vast, faceless bureaucracies that control information about those lands that we own. I'll never forget talking to one so-called expert in one of those so-called expert agencies who told me there were no valley quail in the entire state, even though in the past three seasons I'd shot dozens of them there. So... You know, go at it with a grain of salt, but take advantage of some of the knowledge that some of these bureaucrats actually do have. There are some good ones and there are some not so good ones. Be polite, but be persistent. And eventually you'll probably get a nugget here and a nugget there of information that might be of value to you on your next out of area public land, do it yourself, walk in hunt. Yeah. It takes a little bit of work, but gosh almighty, sometimes it pays off. I've had just the opposite experience many times as well. So, you know, it cuts both ways. Look for the good ones, jettison the bad ones. All right. As I mentioned earlier, my good friends in Huron, South Dakota, welcome you. Learn more about all their walk-in areas at hunthuronsd.com. Last I counted, they had 124,000 acres of public access within 60 miles of town. In town's pretty fun as well. And just one quick reminder, get your hearing checked, protect it too. Go to ESPAmerica.com and find out how, and more particularly, find out why. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the Upland Nation podcast as I have in giving it to you. Thanks again to Robert Milner for all of his wisdom, decades and decades worth. And by the way, thank you for your service also, Colonel. Thank you, listeners, for being a part of the Upland Nation. Want to talk more? Go to the Upland Nation or the Wing Shooting USA Facebook pages. Tell all your friends. They can listen anytime at uplandnation.com do me a big favor rate us or review us wherever you get your podcasts it helps a lot we want everybody to know more about the upland nation and the podcast in particular i know we're still on a pretty short lead but we can still correspond with and be close to family and friends literally or figuratively And of course, this is a great time to spend more time with our dogs. We will be hunting this fall. I hope to see you in the field. In the meanwhile, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again for listening. I'm Scott Linden.